This is produced as part of the ongoing work on the website, the way, the truth, and the life dot net. Clarifying confusion and ignorance. Quran, Islam, and Muslim. In the background here, uh, Bruno Bettelheim was a Jew that escaped from a Nazi concentration camp by someone buying him out before that was stopped. He became a professor at Chicago University and had an institution for autistic children. That he made many studies of survivors of the Holocaust and one of his uh, studies had to do with folk tales in the Jewish and other cultures. He was a, a Jew by birth but he was not a religious Jew. That when he studied folk tales he found that the uh, tales in the uh, Jewish Bible, which is the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, that these stories like the jealous brother Cain killed Abel and so forth, uh, that these types of stories exist in uh, all storytelling culture, that uh, the uh, things that have value tend to go on and on where the foolish stories get dropped, that the um, folk tales are a way of passing on the wisdom of the elders. And uh, the Jewish Old Testament is uh, made up of these folk tales uh, of large part, the folk tales being recorded. And also uh, it is uh, written by m many sources, not just one. And it's the insight of the prophets that are writing. It isn't usually taken as uh, uh, God directly speaking as in the Quran, but rather the, the uh, ability of the prophet to get a sense of God's will. A big difference here. Major claims for the Quran. One, it was claimed that Allah's words came directly without change to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. Two, during Muhammad's lifetime, Allah could change what he had declared and the latest declaration was what counted. Three, the Quran gives permission to deceive the unbeliever and permission to husbands to deceive their wives. Four, the order of precedence or importance of the surahs is hidden from the uninitiated outsider or new converts. It is in a confused or not organized chronologically. Five, children are to memorize the Quran. Muhammad got this from the Jewish, which learned that they could perpetuate their culture by requiring their young men to memorize the Torah. Next, I will give detailed references for these five statements. Major claims for the Quran. One. The Quran is claimed to be the exact record of Allah speaking verbatim to Muhammad through Gabriel. It is claimed to have been memorized and later recorded verbatim from Wikipedia Quran. Muslims believe the Quran was repeatedly revealed to, from Allah to Muhammad verbally through the angel Gabriel over a period of approximately 23 years, beginning in 610 Christian era, when he was 40, and concluding in 632 Christian era, the year of his death. Followers of Islam further believe that the Quran was memorized, recited, and written down by Muhammad's companions after every revelation dictated by Muhammad. Most of Muhammad's 
tens of thousands of companions called Sahabas learned the Quran by heart, repeatedly recited it in front of Muhammad for his approval or the approval of other Sabahas. Muslim tradition agrees that although the Quran was authentically memorized completely by tens of thousands verbally, the Quran was still established textually into a single book from shortly after Muhammad's death by order of the first caliph Abu Bakr, suggested by his future successor Umar Hafsa, Muhammad's widow and Umar's daughter was entrusted with the Quran text after the second caliph Umar died. The words in white are reference links and may be followed either from Wikipedia or from my website. The most ancient Qurans have been discovered in Yemen and have been studied by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. The information is available from them showing that the Quran is not stable and that there are many different varieties of interpretation. Muslims believe the Quran to be the Word of God as dictated to the Prophet Muhammad, while most Christians and Jews understand their holy texts to be authored by men inspired by God. This distinction means that critical analysis of the sacred texts, which has so enlightened Christian and Jewish thinking since the 16th century, becomes an extremely sensitive issue when it's applied to the Quran. And it doesn't help when those scholars who are making the attempt are largely Western non-Muslims. Can their studies really shed new light on the text and its origins? In 1972, during the restoration of the Great Mosque of Sana'a, capital of North Yemen, workers discovered a mash of old parchments in a loft between the inner and outer roofs. The entire load was stuffed into some 20 potato sacks, where it might have remained were it not for the arrival, seven years later, of Dr. Gerd Puin, a German scholar and Quranic expert. Puin immediately grasped the significance of the find. Working with a team of local assistants, he carefully prized the layers apart and fired off thousands of photographs. Four fragments immediately caught Puin's attention. They contained the first and last chapters of the Quran, and unlike any other Qurans in existence, they were illustrated with architectural drawings of mosques vital clue to their origin. Because of its drawings, because of the art historical context, you can date this Quran very precisely to the time of Al-Walid. This is the reign between 705 and 715. The oldest datable Quran in the world created some 70 years after the death of the Prophet. From the potato sacks, Puyin identified fragments from nearly a thousand different Qurans. Comparisons between them and the standard Cairo text in use today are startling. These early texts are written in a kind of shorthand with no vowel markings or distinguishing dots, which means that individual words can have up to 30 different meanings. The sheer existence of so many different possible readings would suggest that this text wasn't passed down word for word. The text isn't as stable as it seems in the Cairo version. In der Fassung von Cairo erscheint. There was another important discovery amongst the Sana fragments. 
the application of simple forensic techniques revealed earlier texts that had been washed off and overwritten. Although the hidden text revealed no contradictory meanings, words had been changed, verses and whole chapters rearranged. If his researches are correct, particularly on dating, it suggests, in fact, that the Qur'an was not a single product, a single entity that was fixed by 650, but actually developed much, much later, hence the uh, overlaying of texts or written materials. None of this phases Islamic scholars past and present. They are adamant that the integrity of the text has been preserved through a strong oral tradition, and if differences occur in earlier written versions, they say these are due to regional and colloquial variations of the same words and phrases. We accept that there is a, a diversity from the very beginning on very uh, uh, marginal things. It's not changing first the central message of the Quran, the pillars of our faith. Major claims of the Quran, point two. During Muhammad's lifetime, Allah could change what he had declared and the latest declaration was what counted. See Surah 2 verse 106 from Wikipedia, Quran, because the Quran is spoken in classic Arabic, many of the latter converts to Islam, mostly non-Arabs, did not always understand the Quranic Arabic. They did not catch the allusions that were clear to early Muslims fluent in Arabic, and they were concerned with reconciling apparent conflicts of themes in the Quran. Commentators erudite in Arabic explained the allusions and perhaps most importantly explained which Quranic verses had been revealed early in Muhammad's prophetic career as being appropriate to the very earliest Muslim community and which had been revealed later canceling out, abrogating the earlier texts. Point three, the Quran gives permission to deceive the unbeliever and husbands to deceive wives. Surah 9.1 This is a declaration of immunity by Allah and his apostle towards those of the idolaters with whom you have made an agreement. So go about the land for four months and know that you cannot weaken Allah and that Allah will bring disgrace to the unbeliever and an announcement from Allah and his apostle to the people on the day of the greater pilgrimage that Allah and his apostle are free from liability to the idolaters. Therefore, if you repent, it will be better for you. And if you turn back, then know that you will not weaken Allah and announce painful punishment to those who disbelieve except those of the idolaters with whom you have made an agreement, then they have not failed you in anything and have not backed up anyone against you. So, so fulfill their agreement to the end of their term. Surely Allah loves those who are careful of their duty. So when the sacred months have passed, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Take them captives and besiege them. Lie in wait for them in every ambush. Then if they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, that's extortion, leave their way free to them. Surely Allah is forgiving, merciful. Surah 2.225 Allah does not call you to account for what is in your oaths, but will call you to account for what is in your hearts have earned. And Allah is forgiving and forbearing. O Prophet, why should you forbid yourself that which Allah has made lawful for you? You seek to please your wives, and Allah is forgiving, merciful. Allah indeed has sanctioned for you the expiation of your oaths 
and Allah is your protector and he is the knowing the wise Point four, the order of the surahs hides from the outsider and a new convert which surahs are valid. That is given the uh, surah two with the abrogation that older uh, surahs are replaced by the more recent ones and they're not put in chronological order so that you could tell this. The published order, not the order of date conceived. Uh, order of precedence, uh, I will uh, show in the left-hand column uh, with the surahs uh, shown in white, their title, their surah numbers shown in white 
to the left of them will be the uh, chronological order that uh, starts with surah number one is actually back 110th on the list so you can see there's a great deception here that uh, I will put that uh, uh, on the uh, video so that you can see it and you can also find it on the website I'll put the website address there also The web address needs to be entered as a single line with no spaces. This is an article that parades as academic literature in the Educational Resource Information Center. It's titled Memorization and Learning in Islamic Schools and authored by Helen N. Boyle. We will give the abstract and look into the details as we go on. A brief narrative description of the journal article, document, or resource. In recent years, the purpose and methods of Islamic schools have received increased scrutiny from non-Muslim and Muslim leaders as well as the Western media, often leading to negative publicity, criticisms, and statements of official concern. The lack of appreciation of the distinction between radical and ordinary Islamic schools is due to a lack of understanding of the underlying assumptions and related practices of education in Islam. A key source of this misunderstanding concerns the role that memorization plays in relation to knowledge, learning, understanding, and reasoning, all of which have nuances in Islamic education that do not inhere in Western conceptions of these words. Without an appreciation of the purpose of memorization in the educational process and with the media images of children rocking back and forth, memorizing the Quran and reciting it in unison under the watchful eyes of stern-looking teachers, the basic mission of Islamic schooling has become confounded in the West with ideas of promoting violence and terrorism or inculcating a particularly radical, extremist, or militant view of Islam. Thus, the other purposes of Islamic schooling have not been highlighted. Drawing on data from field research in Morocco, Yemen, and Nigeria, the author suggests that Quranic memorization is a process of embodying the divine, the words of God, and as such is a far more learner-oriented and meaningful process than is typically described. She argues, furthermore, that the mission of contemporary Quranic schooling, with Quranic memorization at its core, is concerned with developing spirituality and morality as well as with providing an alternative to public education, when the availability and quality of public schooling is limited. Contains one figure and 34 footnotes. At first glance, it's just another ordinary surgical procedure. But this is a perfectly healthy man about to have his hand amputated. A convicted cattle thief, he's the first person to be punished under Islamic or Sharia law, now sweeping across the Muslim north of Nigeria. These images, recorded by Sharia activists, keen to display their civilized method of punishment. We are telling people that, look, this is what God said in his law, and whoever dares to commit offenses against God and against humanity will receive that punishment. Later in recovery, the hapless thief begins a second sentence, learning how to cope with a lifelong disfigurement. But there's much more at stake than just medieval forms of punishment. Sharia now threatens to dismember a nation divided between Muslim North and largely Christian South. It's not a story Nigerian authorities want told. They fear the growing popularity of this man, the governor of Zemfara State, who's risen from obscurity to lead this Islamic revival. Seven other Muslim states have now heeded his call. He says he won't stop until all Nigeria is under Sharia rule. Do you think Nigeria should become a Sharia nation? That is my ambition, and that is the ambition of every Muslim in this country. Gathering in prayer in a Lahore cathedral. 
Pakistani Christians, a vulnerable minority in this overwhelmingly Muslim nation. They fear for themselves and for a fellow believer on death row just an hour from here. This is Asiya Bibi, the first woman sentenced to hang under Pakistan's controversial blasphemy law. Death sentences in other cases have been overturned on appeal, but she's now a marked woman. In the village, they tried to put a noose around my neck so they could kill me, she said in this brief appearance outside her jail cell. Her family too is at risk, forced into hiding, so we met them after dark. Her husband Ashik is exhausted from being on the run from guarding the children at night and from threatening phone calls. When they threaten me, they ask my name. I don't tell them. I ask who they are. They won't tell me. But they say, we'll deal with you if we get our hands on you. Asiya's troubles began here in her village. Hers was the only Christian household was working in the fields alongside local Muslim women. They claimed she insulted the Prophet Muhammad. She says she was falsely accused to settle an own score. Human rights groups said that's often the case with the blasphemy law. At the village mosque, they want the death sentence carried out. The local imam says he cried with joy when Asiya was sentenced. He told us He'll be made to pay, one way or the other. If the, law punishes, for blasphemy, the if the law punishes someone for blasphemy, and that person is pardoned or released, then we will take the law into our own hands. Already, Islamic groups are out on the streets, promising anarchy if Asya is freed. Her case has provoked some debate about reforming the blasphemy law, but the government would have to face down the hardliners. There seems little appetite for that. For now, Asya remains behind bars here at Shekhapura Jail, where she's been held in isolation. But in jail or out of it, she could be at risk. Human rights workers say several people accused of blasphemy have been killed in prison and others have been shot dead in court premises. Just being charged with blasphemy can be a death sentence. It was for the two Christian brothers buried here, killed in a courthouse in July. Relatives asked us to hide their faces. They visit the graves once a month. They're too frightened to come here more often. Order here in BBC News, Punjab. Here we see a man sentenced to death in Afghanistan for converting from Islam to Christianity. This is February 2011. Then we see that in 2004 in Iran, by Sharia law, they executed a 16-year-old, a 16-year-old girl for crime against chastity. Just a couple of hours north lies the heartland of the Islamic revival. Zamfara, home of farming and Sharia, proclaims the state boundary marker. In contrast to his Kaduna colleague, Zamfara's governor, Ahaji Sunni Ahmed, has the aura of a political winner. He's become a powerful new political player, loved in the Muslim north. You were the first governor to introduce Sharia law. Yes. Others have followed. Yes. In other states, there has been huge loss of life. Yeah. But Sharia is steadily making its mark on the streets of Zamfara's state capital, Gusau. Cinemas have closed. Under Islamic law, it's an offence to replicate the human image. Unless it happens to be the governor on the TV news. And gone are the women's colourful headscarves, replaced by the sombre tones of Islam. Matched by the mood of many women, sitting silently in their newly segregated buses and taxis, now forbidden from talking to us. It's just a small part of Governor Sani's Islamic New Order.
is all determined and defined. The, 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 the type of education, the responsibility and the role of the child when he grew up in the society, up to the time he's going to die and then be buried in the grave, even how to go to the toilet. You have to enter with the left leg, you say certain prayers, seeking refuge and protection from the evils that are in the toilets. And when you come out, you come out with the right leg, uh, thanking God for removing the, the dirty things that are in your stomach. Zamfaru's schools are now segregated by sex, but not by religion. Daughters of the few remaining Christian families, distinguishable by their shorter headscarves. Theoretically, they're exempt from Sharia. Their lives still governed by the National Civil Law Code. But in reality, those who stay toe the line. Christian girls are forced to attend compulsory Quranic studies classes. And since our visit, a 17-year-old Muslim girl has been sentenced to 180 lashes for falling pregnant out of wedlock. A relatively benevolent ruling, given some of the other punishments now in store. And you're prepared to order the beheading of people if they commit an offence? Yes, that is the dictates of Sharia. All Muslims knew, know about it. What's happened to the crime rate here since you introduced very, it? Very, in fact, it's virtually no crime. It's crime-free because the percentage of crime is uh, compared to what obtained before Sharia. Uh, I think it's ni over 90 percent has been eradicated completely. <laughs> Sharia has proved to be hugely popular in this community, sick of the crime and corruption that inflicts all Nigeria. Discrimination against Christians and women deemed a small price to pay. In a deliberate display of transparency, Zamfara's administrators now meet in public. Governor Sani knows politics is all about perception and pragmatism. The beard is now obligatory for every pious Muslim male. No one seems to notice the clean-shaven pre-Sharia portrait of the governor, taken barely 12 months ago. But Sunni Ahmed is on a dangerous political pilgrimage. He's turned Zamfara state away from Nigeria's secular ideals and is now faced firmly towards Mecca. You see, if you want to know what Sharia is all about, the true model of Sharia, you go to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a country in the, 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 the number one country in the world that is implementing Sharia according to Islamic rules and regulations. So is Saudi Arabia a role model for you? Yeah, that is our model. Here in 2008, we see a Saudi girl ordered by the government to be killed for converting to Christianity. And it was her father that carried out the murder as an honor killing ordered by the government. Do you think Nigeria should become a Sharia nation? That is my ambition, and that is the ambition of every Muslim in this country. We want Sharia to be implemented for all Muslims in Nigeria, while the Christian will be governed by the common law. Christians watching this in Nigeria would be very angered by those comments, the things you've just said then. How, how will they be angered? That but is my own uh, uh, opinion, and I'm entitled to my own opinion as a, in a democratic society. The riots have paralyzed one of Nigeria's key cities, Kaduna, once again the scene of murder in the streets. People who died because they got in the way of protests about Miss World coming to Nigeria. They've asked everybody to run away. And they are still in a state of shock. Children stand bewildered, but few can understand if this was really a cause to die for. They can count the dead and save possessions. Certainly a hundred died, probably more. The authorities are trying to impose a 24-hour curfew to quell the protests and restore order. Kaduna is divided between Christians and Muslims. And militant mobs are easily recruited to protest on either side of that religious divide. 
The worst riots here were two years ago when maybe 2,000 died after a Christian protest march about the imposition of Muslim Sharia law turned violent. Now the arrival of women for a beauty contest has set the fires alight again. The contestants, who are already in Nigeria, have continued their preparations. The Miss World organization say the show will go on. They blame irresponsible journalism for the deaths after the riots began outside the offices of a newspaper which mocked Islamic protests about the competition. There are contestants from several Muslim countries, but five countries, including South Africa, are boycotting the event because some women in Nigeria are facing death by stoning for having babies outside marriage. Miss England chose not to join the boycott. David Loyne, BBC News. And finally tonight, a new report is out saying that Islamic Sharia law is gaining an increasing foothold in Great Britain. The director of the Institute for the Study of Islam and Christianity has even gone so far as to say that there is, quote, an alternative parallel unofficial legal system operating in the Muslim communities there. But the real story is most of us here in the U.S. have no idea what Sharia law even is. So tonight we're going to do a little primer, Sharia Law 101, if you will. But first, I want to start with an exclusive video of an interview view with a Saudi Arabian, remember there are allies, a Saudi Arabian Sharia law executioner that aired on Lebanese television earlier this month. I want you to watch this very closely. In the this is the most renowned executioner in Saudi Arabia who carries out the executions. His sword delineates the border between seriousness and play. There is no negotiating with him once the heads have ripened. When it's harvesting time, he is the most suited for the job. Do you cut off hands or do you just do beheadings? Yes, yes. I carry out the punishment of cutting off thieves' hands, as well as the cutting off of a hand and a leg on alternate sides, as is written in the Quran. Abdallah, when you carry out the punishment of cutting off limbs, do you anesthetize the condemned person? Or is it done without anesthesia, like beheadings? With regard to the cutting off of a hand, or of both a hand and a leg, it is done with local anesthesia only. Have you ever beheaded someone you knew? Yes, I have beheaded many people who are my friends. But whoever commits an offense brings it on himself. A viewer from Riyadh called to ask whether you execute both men and women? Do you execute women? And do you feel anything different when you execute a woman or a man? An execution is an execution. The difference is that sometimes when you execute a man, he cannot control his nerves and sit or stand straight so that the job can be done. What are we facing? Paul Marshall is a, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, an ex expert on uh, Sharia law. Uh, what we just witnessed, is this radicalized Sharia law in uh, Saudi Arabia or is this the regular stuff? Um, this is a radicalized form. What the Saudis do, you don't find it in many other places. Okay. Now, what is taking a foothold? What we just talked about, um, uh, that uh, you know, it is starting to spread, and we're starting to see it in places like Great Britain, where there is a subculture, an, a, another set of laws that aren't on anybody's books. Is that radicalized Sharia law? Um, what some of the things happening in in Britain are, you know, Sharia has can cover everything from how you pray. It deals with divorce and marriage, and then it also deals with murder and adultery. Um, in Britain and in Canada and other places, the most of the push for Sharia has been ab about marriage, divorce, inheritance. But there are now cases in Britain where, in a case of assault, in a case of stabbing. Uh, 
uh, some Muslims set up a, a sort of their own Sharia court and adjudicated that on their own. And in fact, the the family of the person who'd done the stabbing paid the family of the person who'd been stabbed, and that's all that happened. Though is is this this is this the same law um, that is allowing people in in Europe, um, at least in their own head, to get away with honor killings? It overlaps with that. In, in explain first, explain that for anybody who doesn't know what an honor killing. An is. honor killing is that if someone in your family has has done something shameful, the whole family is ashamed. Let's say your daughter's been going out with a guy you didn't want her to go out with, or let's say one of your family members stopped being a Muslim, became an atheist or a Christian or something, that this brings shame on your family. To get rid of that shame, you have to kill the person. I, 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 I find this so frightening. It, this is the same kind of stuff that, correct me if I'm wrong, you're an expert in this. Is this the same kind of stuff that leads us to the mass genocide that we see uh, in Darfur? Um, yes, in um, in Sudan, in the in the previous genocide in in the south, and now dealing with Darfur, the Sudanese government has received you know, judgments from Islamic jurists that this is in fact a, a jihad war, um, it's a war in the name of Islam, and uh, they should proceed like that. And we are seeing an uptick uh, all around the world. Are we seeing an uptick here in the United States in this kind of understanding? I know I talked to a guy here in New York that was born in New York, mm -hmm. and he says this is the answer. Well, you're seeing it first around the world. You know, 30 years ago, Saudi Arabia was about the only country which did these kinds of things. And now you've got a similar thing in Iran, in Sudan, uh, parts of Pakistan. You're seeing that in Nigeria. Now, the, in the takeover in Somalia in the last year, the same thing is there. So these, these very radical extremist forms of law are spreading. And there's certainly some push. It's very weak at the moment. Right. But there's some push in the United States to, okay. uh, to have them. Paul, I, I just we only have a minute left. I want to just rapid fire here. True or false? You tell me if these things are true or not. With radicalized uh, Shira, uh, Shira, uh, Sharia law, a woman uh, can be accused by one witness of adultery but needs four witnesses to say it was not adultery. True or false? Uh, correct. People are compelled to go to public beheadings as a spectator sport in stadiums. True or false? Uh, correct, in Saudi Arabia or uh, previously in Afghanistan. Women are not allowed to be educated in parts of Pakistan. Correct. Women are not allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia. Correct. It, true or false, drinking wine, you can receive flogging. Uh, yeah, in quite, somewhere in Sudan, that will happen to you. Paul, uh, frightening stuff. We will have you back again. And uh, I felt very happy because my son said, Daddy, if I died, Thank you that I, I would be with the Lord. Perhaps it's little more than blind faith. He's staking the lives of his 500 remaining parishioners on the ability of the Abbasanjo government to succeed in achieving national unity when all before them have failed. Burdened by this huge responsibility, he can do little more than pray that the rest of his congregation doesn't end up on this hillside. This is the last piece on this particular video. It has to do with polio. Uh, throughout the uh, uh, globe there are uh, Islamic clerics or Imams that uh, will not allow Muslims to have um, vaccination. And then uh, members of that community carry the infection to Mecca for a Hajj and people from all over the world. So we're the WHO, World Health Organization, had hoped to have poliomyelitis eradicated. It keeps breaking out from parts of the world where millions of dollars have been spent to eradicate it. I take this very serious. I had an aunt that had polio and I had an uncle that had polio. My aunt couldn't care for her babies because her arms were too disabled. And my 
uncle had one leg much shorter than the other because of it. I'll uh, show you some of these parts. نحن عندك سيادة المراقب طبعا وأحداث دارفور تلقي بظلالها على السودان وذات أن أسألك ما رأيك بما يحصل بما يحصل من هو المسؤول عما يحصل هناك الغرب والأمريكان على وجه الخصوص دبروا لهذا الأمر منذ سنوات مضى الغرب والأمريكان الأمريكان نعم على وجه التحديد يعني والسبب إنهم درسوا هذه المنطقة دراسة وافية منطقة دارفور تحديدا يعني نعم وأدركوا تماما أنها تزخر بكنوز ليس له لا من مثيل في السودان حتى الآن و... يعني يعني برأيك سيادة المراقب أنه الأمريكيين هم وراء ما يحصل في دارفور نعم نعم وهم وراء كل المصائب التي تحدث الآن في خارج دارفور هل هل تقبل سياده المراقب العام انه ان يحكم السودان رجل مسيحي مثلا الان بعد ان دخلنا في اتفاقات السلام هنا لا اقبل لا اقبل حتى ولو ان الشعب انتخبه مثلا انا انا اتكلم عن لما ينتخب الشعب ويبقى حقيقه خلاص اصبح حقيقه اما راينا لا شو السبب نعم نعم السبب في ذلك انه الاسلام لا يقر يعني ولاية غير المسلم على المسلم م. أنك أصدرت فتوى بمنع تطعيم الأطفال على اعتبار أن خلف ذلك مؤامرة أيضا مسونية يهودية صحيح الكلام؟ الكلام ده صحيح مئة في المئة كيف؟ وأنا تابعت الموضوع ده في عدة مقالات يعني, يعني تهز الحجر لكن لم يهتز أحد من الحكومة بس من اين اتتك المعلومات انه نعم. في مؤامره؟ انا انا متابع المساله ومعي أخ اخوين ثلاثه كده متابعين المساله دي عالميا من خلال الانترنت من خلال بعض اجهزه الاعلام من خلال ممارسات الوزاره اللي بتنتج هذه العمليه لا انا بعتبرها في حق الاطفال جريمه. طب كيف ما في مراقبة صحية سلطات هنا تراقب مراقبة صحية م. يقال أن في مراقبة صحية أنا يعني كتبت وتحديت وزارة الصحة في أن تجي نلتقي مع بعض في 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 حوار أنه هني بيثبتوا أنا أثبت وهم ينفوا فرفضوا إلى أن يعني والحمد لله الحمل اللي أنا قمت بها في هذا الجانب اتت ثمارها ونجت الاف الاطفال من الوقوع في في براسم الحركه اليهوديه التي يعني الممثله في في حياه الامم دي اسمها الماسونيه لا الماسونيه اللي هي وراء وراء هذا الموضوع لان اليهود الان لو وجدوا طريق عشان يقضوا على الناس في العالم كله وينفردهم في نهايه الامر بالحكم this page shows places where polio has broken out, largely in Muslim areas, and um, you can stop frame to view and uh, follow references. Memorization, Why and Why Not, August 10th, 2010, taken from the way, the truth, and the life.net by Donald Johnson. I'm going to talk to you about memorization as a cultural trait and the good part and the bad part of it. The background of memorization is through the Jewish culture where they were required to memorize the books of Moses. In the Fertile Crescent, before the time of Abraham, already there was affluence. There were cities. There were uh, power people a class of rulers and they had enough wealth to afford servants and wherever this happens the wealthy get wet nurses and babysitters for their children and their children who inherit the power are deprived of those mammalian uh, nursing bonds and uh, paternal relationships that give uh, 
protection and provision, and they often end up sociopathic or psychopathic and ultimately lead to much evil in the culture. But uh, that's in the background. Abraham uh, rebelled against the practice of child sacrifice. This, uh, just like today, they're murdering in the order of 60 million babies a year, uh, unwanted uh, pregnancies. But uh, in those days, they would throw them in a fire to some god or throw them off a cliff or throw them in a river or leave them for the animals to get in the woods. But uh, Abraham set a precedent of uh, not sacrificing children. And that was the foundation for uh, being sanctified. Sanctified means separated, separated from the rest of humankind, a special culture respecting life. And that went on uh, after the uh, freedom from Egypt. Uh, the theme was reinforced by Moses with the Ten Commandments. That, that, um, and the memorization was installed to protect that culture, to memorize that the, that the young men would not have the freedom to think on their own. When you're forced to memorize, you can either comply or rebel. And in the Jewish culture, uh, rebellion meant rejection by the family. Now, much of uh, uh, Christianity and Judaism were picked up by uh, Muhammad, and he took the license to rape, pillage, and plunder as a uh, uh, service to Allah. And uh, still today, sending children off as suicide bombers is uh, in, in uh, the Quran is justified. Uh, it's holy war, and they have a, uh, a, a blessing for their sacrifice in eternity. At any rate, uh, this memorization is common to many cults. It deprives uh, the memorizer of the individual freedom to grow in individual sovereignty. They can comply and rebel. The same as the supposed enlightenment in Europe was, much of it was led, like the communist uh, ideology, by rebellious Jews who were rebelling against the, their constraints of memorization. But they really weren't free. Uh, and you see how corrupted uh, communism uh, was in its implementation, how much they murdered. Uh, their own people. It, uh, so memorization uh, was lost. They rebelled against that culture. But we can, through mammalian caring for our children, we can raise children that are able to care for others like self and be thankful to their source of creation, their source of existence. And they don't need to memorize. They can learn at a later age what other people have said and thought, but they can be free to think and see for themselves. Like Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. That's God. We, we, there's nothing outside of God. God is reality. But a nuclear reality, chemical reality, biological reality, uh, sociological reality, psychological reality. Uh, it's uh, physical reality. In him we live and move and have our being. And uh, the memorization will only deny the one forced to memorize the freedom to grow as an individual. They can rebel or comply. In Islam they can't rebel. It's the death penalty by Sharia law. 
So this is the background of memorization and the harm it has done and the harm it's doing today. What we really need to do is respect the rights of every conceived child that it be conceived in health and cared for by a million uh, nursing bonds and uh, paternal relationships that give uh, protection and provision mother that is capable of giving that mammalian nursing bond. Uh, more on that later. Thank you. And uh, if, you, if I look at my life, I, I, I looked at Judaism, and um, forgive me, I don't mean to be rude, but you go to the synagogue and they're singing and moaning and praying and bowing backwards and forwards and sometimes in the language you can understand and sometimes in the more liberal synagogues they just keep teaching you and teaching you and teaching you there's no end to book learning I remember the day I dropped a bible on the ground and someone said pick it up and kiss it I said you know what you can kiss oh that was boy a, that's, see, uh, that's uh, weird well that's, the point is I never forgot it because it yeah. was my stand but I never, I never rejected Judaism. I, yeah. It was dry. It was uh, uh, the history is beautiful. Moses and everything is wonderful. It's telling me something, but I can't see that as a way of life. Meaning, I have to study that all the time, and I have to belong to it. No, otherwise, I belong to it. I'm not my own person. It's it's a yoke round my neck. It doesn't need me anywhere. And then I looked at Christianity, and I I looked at those people, and they had it. They had the fulfillment, just like uh, Ann Coulter. Ah, she thinks she's a Christian. No, she isn't. But it's all of a sudden she's high on it. I know she's got tremendous conflict. That girl, woman has tremendous conflict, a tremendous ego. She's a compensator, and she's lost the meaning of life. And she's, she, suddenly she's got a group of people who love her the way she are because she, she's a conservative, and these people embrace the conservative is her, and she's made a lot of money, but she's miserable. But now suddenly she's got new faith. Now she has religion. And now she's pontificating with it. But that's not that's false. That's not real. And so I've seen both sides of the aisle. Thank you for downloading from the BBC. When I read the Quran, I believe God is speaking to me. When I'm standing in prayer and reciting God's words, I believe I'm speaking to God himself. The text has something of the power, the majesty of the infinite cosmos. It's like the Hubble Space Telescope and you see another million galaxies out there and you feel really small. It continues to inspire me, the Quran. It's continuing to reveal itself to me. And, you know, I'm looking forward to this Ramadan and sitting down and just reading a few pages and see what happens next. There wasn't always a text to read, though, and there is a direct link between how the Prophet Muhammad received the word of God and how millions of Muslims learn the Quran. As a child, I had to learn it by heart. I still know it by heart. And we were examined every year in the Quran orally to make sure that we haven't forgotten it. And that is what makes me able to sit in the underground and read my daily quota without looking at the text. Like Muslim children all over the world, I too was taught to recite and learn the Quran by heart. In this edition of Heart and Soul from the BBC World Service, we explore that oral tradition and the role of Arabic as the sacred language of the Quran. The traditional account of how the Quran came into being 1400 years ago, according to the Gregorian calendar, is well known to Muslims. The Prophet Muhammad, then 40 years old, was in the habit of retreating to a cave on Mount Hira, just north of Mecca, to meditate. Tim Winter, a lecturer in Islamic studies at Cambridge University and himself a Muslim, takes up the story. During one of these retreats, the angel of revelation, who in Islam is identified with the, the angel Gabriel, appeared before him in what was obviously a very terrifying way and grabbed the prophet and squeezed him and then released him and then said, recite. 
And the prophet said, I can't recite, I don't read, I don't write. And then the angel grabbed him a second time and told him again, Iqra, recite. And the third time, he grabbed him and said, recite, Iqra. And when the prophet again repeats the same reply, the angel Gabriel dictates to the prophet the very first words of the Quran to be revealed. Recite in the name of your Lord who created, created man from clots of blood. Recite. Images of very young children swaying in madrasas learning to read the Quran without necessarily understanding what they're reading have given rote learning a bad name. But according to Tim Winter, we should be wary of underestimating the power and value of such learning. Child development is becoming better understood. A nerve growth factor is present in certain areas of the brain at certain times and the neural network develops uh, stimulated by what's happening in the environment of the child at that time. And it is time dependent. This was first demonstrated with rats where they were um, kept blinded at birth and different groups had the blinders taken off at different times and then allowed to mature into adulthood uh, they were sacrificed and the neural network and visual capacity were investigated and it clearly showed that after a certain period of time that growth nerve growth factor was no longer present in the visual area and even though the stimulation was permitted the brain development didn't happen the same is true with uh, all areas of our brain in early brain development. The nerve growth factor is there at a, a time for learning. And if we uh, play with this, we destroy the what uh, we call common sense and the foundation for individual sovereignty, a person growing based on their observations of space, matter, and motion and their insights into the cause-effect relationships. Uh, they're unable to differentiate between an observation and an opinion. They've been programmed at an early age where they lack the uh, natural intuition I will show you later a young boy programmed uh, to be ready to be a suicide bomber. And it's really, if you look at his face, it's like he's serving God. It's, it's an innocent child that has confused uh, a, a lie and the truth because he's been uh, forced to memorize the thoughts of someone else that he respected. But uh, one another example of how deleterious this manipulation of children in early development can be at uh, Phi Delta Kappa there was uh, research uh, presented by a University of Buffalo professor into spelling ability and the difference between rote memorization and phonetic uh, learning of spelling and what effect it had if they were started during this nerve growth factor life stage if they were started on phonetics and changed to rote memorization what effect did that have on the development of the neurological network and the reverse if they were started on rote memorization and changed to phonetics well the research clearly showed the best spellers were those consistently taught with phonetics, pr uh, pronouncing and, and uh, sounding out the words. The second best was the, uh, the, the uh, consistent rote memorization. The third best was those who during this uh, brain growth stage were switched from uh, phonetics to rote memorization. The fourth group changed from rote memorization to phonetics 
were basically disabled and I happened to fall into that category. I went to a two-room country school and they changed teachers in the middle of my learning and the older teacher was, and my father were teaching rote memorization cat mat sat with flashcards type of thing and uh, the new teacher uh, was come in with phonetics but uh, we need to respect these things now I'll show you the picture of that innocent boy who has no foundation of his own to go on he's ready to commit suicide murder and it's not because he's a bad person it's because his own experience has been supplanted by some indoctrination by someone he respected watch this <laughs> One of the campers, when asked if he wants to blow himself up as a suicide bomber, answers, Yes. You can see the innocence on this boy's face. As an adult, he will be able to commit murder and suicide, even as a boy. He is prepared to do that now. He will, as an adult, not have the freedom to get a foundation different than what he has so he will have to either rebel or comply his opportunity for individual sovereignty which rests in his childhood was stolen from him this programming of children and the memorization and depriving them of their natural experience of space matter and motion living in reality in the physical reality we live and move and have our being and our childhood foundation needs to be in these experiences not confused with authority figure dictates or memorization they can reserve those things learning other people's thoughts and memorizing them for adulthood when we have the ability to discriminate and make judgment and not confuse the things that we're being indoctrinated with with our uh, real observations and the insight real insights into cause effect relationships if we're indoctrinated we cannot differentiate between the, what we have experienced as reality and those insights and what we've been programmed into believing because it's someone else's thoughts put in our brain before we were old enough to discriminate. Thank you. This is the end of uh, part one.